Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our guest is 2004 St. Norbert College graduate Rebecca McKean, and we'll discuss how she went about identifying a new prehistoric marine reptile. McKean, who is Assistant Professor of Geology at St. Norbert, had a paper on her discovery appear in Cretaceous Research in November. Her discovery swam the waters covering the western U.S. some 90 million years ago. Rebecca, welcome to the program. Thank you. Well, tell us about your discovery. Well, uh, do you want to know what it is? or? Sure. Um, basically, it's a type of plesiosaur. So plesiosaur, like you said, is a marine reptile, so it's not a dinosaur, even though a lot of people want to call it a dinosaur, but that's kind of just a technicality. Dinosaurs just walked on land. So it was a marine reptile, a plesiosaur. It swam around this ancient seaway. It was a pretty fast swimmer, we think, and fed on fish and squid, so it was actually a predator, pretty fierce and kind of dominated the waters at the at the time it was alive. So how big was this thing? Um, this one that I named is roughly anywhere from 12 to 15 feet long is the estimation that I had, so. 12 to 15, so yeah. that was pretty scary. Yeah, pretty sizable. So this was about 90 million years ago, is mm -hmm. that right? 92 and a half if you want to get something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. millions of years, you've got to put it as close as you can, so. And uh, when I was doing the research for this, I discovered, which I didn't know, that mm -hmm. uh, the middle part of the United States was a yeah. big ocean. Yeah, it was. It's kind of exciting. We don't really think about it often. We think about dinosaurs walking around, which is true, but sea level was a lot higher. So there was this huge corridor of water running down basically from Canada to Mexico that was filled with all kinds of life, not just plesiosaurs, but there were sharks, giant sharks, and um, giant fish that were up to 20 feet long, two different types of plesiosaurs, these things called mosasaurs, which were up to 55 feet long. So it was teeming with all these vertebrates and fish and squid, and there was all kinds of stuff in the seaway at the time. So how big was the seaway? Where did it stretch? Um, so I guess from north to south was, was roughly from Canada to Mexico and then sort of west to east it varied. There were certain times when it was really wide and times when it was narrower, but you can kind of think roughly from Utah to Kansas. It's a good way to think about it. It was pretty sizable. Wow, and mm -hmm. now we have Great Plains there. Is that, mm -hmm. is that a result of that, that, uh, that the, the water just made it all flat? Um, no, that's from, I mean, the seaway is much, much older, and so the topography that we see there today is much more recent. So um, I don't think most people have ever met anybody who's discovered <laughs> anything uh, like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what did you name your, your animal? So the name of it is Dalekarinkops tropicensis, although... Can you say that again? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I've been told it sounds like a sports drink, but um, <laughs> Dalekarinkops is the genus name. That was named previously. There's actually three other species within that particular genus. So in a sense, mine is similar to something that's already been named but it's a new species. So the new species name that I gave it is the Tropicensis. Do you get to name it pretty much whatever you want to in terms of I the, mean, the last, you know? Yeah, there's there's restrictions. You want to kind of be, you know, clear with it. You want to um, be scientific and make sure that the name has some meaning for the organism. So sometimes people will name new things after a specific character, like how that organism looks and how it's different. And sometimes, like what I did, you'll name it after a location. And so I named it after the Tropic Shale, which is the group of rocks that it was actually found in. You can't name it after your first pet or anything like no. that. No, that's you can name it after a person if you want to. So that's another thing, but probably not a pet. I had a lot of people ask me why I didn't name it after myself, and that's really not. It's not <laughs> kind of bad form. Not done. It is. It's very bad form. Well, so. maybe by the time you get to your fifth or sixth uh, <laughs> you know, dinosaur that uh, right. you, you have here. Sure. Um, well, this is a long process. It isn't it just is. that you happen across this thing sure. and say, oh, you know, plant the flag, sure. et cetera. Tell us a little bit about what the process is like sure. and how you got to the point where it was your animal. Sure. Um, the process started actually when I started my master's program at Northern Arizona University. So essentially as soon as I left St. Norbert I went out to Flagstaff and started working and thinking about what I wanted to do and my advisor said, hey we've got this skeleton that's sort of coming out of the ground. We're not sure how much there is but let's go check it out and if there's enough you could do it as a thesis project. And we went out, um, excavated it in the summer of 2005, so quite a long time ago now, 
and found that it was almost a complete skeleton. And so my advisor was really helpful and generous in saying, hey, this skeleton can be essentially your project. You can be the one to describe it and, and prepare it, um, which was extremely generous of him. So I worked on it for my master's, finished my master's in 2006, and had wasn't really sure if it was something new. So I just kind of kept dabbling in it and looking at it, going to museums and studying other people's finds, other plesiosaur skeletons, to try and see if it was really different or if it was something that someone else had described already. And I decided that it was something new. It didn't look like anything that I read about or saw. And so submitted the paper in the summer. Oh, I'm blanking on dates now. The summer of 2010, I think, and then it was finally accepted and published in November. So it's a multi-year process for sure. So here's this thing in the ground. It's mm -hmm. a fossil. It's probably completely stuck to all the rocks uh -huh. around it. Mm -hmm. um, what, what? First of all, how do you know that it's just not a pile of rocks, that it really <laughs> right. is right. an animal? <laughs> and then what do you do to take it out and prepare it and assemble it, what goes into that? Yeah, it's a process. I mean, the excavation was about two weeks long with about 10 people on the site at all times working, you know, 10, 12 hour days and 100 degree weather on black rock. So it was very, very hot and uncomfortable. Wow. But at the same time, at least for me, I'd wanted to do this for so long that I didn't even care. We actually had to set our watches every half an hour to remind us to drink water just because we were all so intensely focused on this thing because it was so amazing. Um, so it was a long excavation process. I guess you know that it's bone because it doesn't look like rock. It actually you know, has a particular shape. It, it looks different. It has a different consistency to it. And actually the bones from this one have this red coating on it so they stand out. They pop out from the rock really well. So you kind of chip it out and you haul it you on a flatbed truck? or Yeah, I mean, we, we plastered a lot of it. So you've seen probably the big plaster jackets before, and that's essentially what we did just in case everything, all of the rock, all of the bone in one big jacket, took it back to the museum. And then I spent about nine months working, you know, when I wasn't studying and doing my classes and writing my thesis, I spent that time um, in the lab huddled over these bones, you know, removing the rock with little picks and gluing pieces together. It's a very labor-intensive process, but it's also really exciting because you're the first person to see this thing that's 90 million years old. I, I can't even imagine what that it's, would be like. It's thrilling. I mean, for me, I know a lot of people might think that it sounds really boring because it's essentially just a 3D jigsaw puzzle that goes on for months and months and months. But for me it is, it's just, it's thrilling because no one's ever seen it before and you're literally gonna be able to tell the story of this animal that's that's so old. It's, I don't know, it's very very exciting. So you say that it ate squid and, mm -hmm. uh, how do you know that? I mean, it's not like you can right. check out the stomach contents or any, or maybe you could, I don't you know. You can actually, not for this one. For this one we have some stomach contents in the form of gastroliths, which are stomach stones. So these plesiosaurs were actually eating rocks, and we don't actually exactly know why they were eating the rocks. There's kind of two different theories on that. Um, but there are other specimens that have been found with stomach contents, with little tiny fish bones and little tiny um, squid shells and things like that. So we actually do know what they ate just based on finding fossilized stomach contents. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound pretty is, cool. Yeah. So here you are, you have to take all the boring classes you have to take when you're oh. working on your PhD <laughs> and all that stuff. And if it were me, I'd just be thinking, I want to get back to the lab. I got to, you know, go yeah. play with my dinosaur. You know? Well, I mean, and part of it was hard because I did my PhD in sedimentology and that wasn't really my passion. I knew after I'd finished my master's that I wanted to study fossils and that's what was gonna make me happy, but I wanted to also make myself marketable so that I could get a job. <laughs> and paleontology, unfortunately, is a very difficult thing to get a job in. There aren't many jobs available and it's, you're very fortunate if you end up being a person to get a job in it. So during that whole PhD time, and which made my, my advisor there kind of sad because he had felt passionate about sedimentology and I kept saying, can we work fossils in here? How can I study fossils? And I ended up studying pocket gopher burrows of all things as part of, yeah, I know. They were 800 year old pocket gopher burrows as part of my PhD research just so that I could try to work fossils in so I could get back to 
what I really, really wanted to do. I think that's actually a not uncommon sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. By the time a lot of people are done with their dissertation, they are yeah. so tired of the topic mm -hmm. that they want to go on and mm -hmm. do something else, but they have to publish in, in See, that, that area. That, that didn't happen with my master's. I mean, it was kind of shocking because I spent so much time on it. And yeah, I wanted to be done when I was done, but I just, I knew that was it. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do paleontology. So this was so. all the way out in southern Utah. Mm -hmm. And, but you grew up here, right? You went to Lake Mills High School, if yeah, I'm not I did mistaken. Yeah, I Lake Mills High School. So mm -hmm. how, and you know, the University of Northern Arizona is kind of a non-obvious place, I would think, coming mm -hmm. from St. Norbert College. How did, what, what attracted you out there? Um, actually, my advisor, I had done a lot of research on different schools. I applied to about five different graduate schools when I was getting ready to leave St. Norbert, and it was all specifically based on what advisor I could work with, since I had been given advice that, you know, choose your advisor wisely, that's who you'll be working with for many years, and I would echo that to um, students thinking about leaving St. Norbert now, but I just had done a lot of research on Dave Gillette, who ended up being my advisor at Northern Arizona, and he had done some amazing research. I met him in person at a conference, and we got along really well, and I just thought, this is going to be a really good person to work with. He knows a lot. He's going to help me, and he you know, understands my personality, my work ethic, and how things are going to go, and so I kind of, I, I mean, I did. I decided to go there because of him, and it was a really good decision. And, uh, but you probably studied uh, stuff around here, right? I mean, in your geology classes here, did you do any mm -hmm. digs or anything like that around the state? No, I no. mean, we don't have things of that age here. We don't have dinosaur fossils at all in Wisconsin. We don't have the right age of rocks to find them in Wisconsin. So I'd done, you know, I'd done research with um, uh, Tim Flood when I was here as a senior thesis project. And so I had a little bit of research experience, but it wasn't a local project. But now I'm doing local projects. I actually have a student who just graduated last year that um, Nelson Hamm and I did a project with her doing some sand dune research in Oconto County in Wisconsin. So Nelson is one of your colleagues on yeah. the geology yeah. thing. Yeah, you, you uh, uh, study sand dunes in mm -hmm. the state, right? And you age them, is that mm -hmm. basically right? Yeah, we date them to figure out how old they are and that kind of helps tell the story about when they formed and what was going on in Wisconsin relatively recently. So what, what would be interesting about Wisconsin geology? I mean, say you're at a party yeah. and someone finds out you're a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an economist and people always want to know what the stock market yeah, is doing. Sure, but but sure. what what kind of questions do people ask you? What, what do you think is interesting about Wisconsin's hmm. geology? I mean, Wisconsin's geology I think is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is just because we have such a long past. We have some of the oldest rocks. I mean, not the oldest rocks anywhere in the world, but we have some really, really old rocks that are about 2 billion years old in the state of Wisconsin down to these really, really young glacial deposits from the last time the, the ice sheet came through um, this area. So we have this huge range of history. Unfortunately for me, the rocks that I um, know the most about are the ones from the Mesozoic, which is when the dinosaurs are around, and we don't have those here. <laughs> we have a lot of really great things in Wisconsin, though. So. So when did you know that you wanted to study dinosaurs? I mean, when you were a little kid, did you watch Land Before Time over and over and over again? Or I didn't, I didn't watch that so much, but I just always, when I was little, I think, I always wanted dinosaur books. I was always reading dinosaur books and detailed ones, not just kids' books, but, you know, the information ones where you got as much information as possible about each type of dinosaur, and I'd memorize their names and how big they were and when they lived, and... I was just fascinated by it, and I was very fortunate to have uh, my parents who were very supportive of it. They knew that that was my passion, and they encouraged it as I was growing up. They'd take me to different dig sites on vacations. and Really? Yeah, actually, I can remember when I was 15, we went to the Mammoth site in Hot Springs, South Dakota, and it's a real dig. You go in, and you get to see people actually digging these mammoths out of this giant old sinkhole, and I, I just wanted to do that more than anything in the world. And actually, through a weird circumstance, actually being that I fainted when we were there because it was very, very hot. Um, and I was, I don't know if I was just overly excited and it was really hot <laughs> or what, but I fainted. And then the director of the site came out to meet me because he felt bad. And my parents said, oh, she's going to be so upset. She was looking forward to this more than anything. And he said, well, come on back. And so I got to meet him and he ended up kind of helping me figure out what to do if I wanted to be a paleontologist, what do you do? 
So I've had kind of a fortunate set of circumstances in that I just always knew what I wanted to do, had people supporting me, and had people that were willing to help me on this path. So so what kind of classes do you have to take to be a paleontologist? So somebody's thinking about going into, mm -hmm. you know, paleontology. What, mm -hmm. what, what do they need to prepare themselves? Well, there's two different routes you can go. You can either go the geology route or the biology route. And I um, didn't really know much about geology when I started, and just turns out that rocks are completely fascinating, which a lot of people <laughs> don't think about. Um, so you can go the geology route, which we have a couple majors right now who are very interested in paleontology, and that's what they're doing. Um, basically because fossils are preserved in sediments. So the more you understand about sediments, the more you can understand about the environments at the time they were around and where to find them and things like that. Or you can go biology route and kind of learn to understand the muscle structures and how these things moved and all that kind of detailed information. So there's kind of two different routes you can go. I think the best way to do things would actually be, you know, major in one and minor in the other so that you have a solid understanding from both backgrounds. How do you know where to start digging? I mean, obviously mm -hmm. you have some idea that, oh, wow, this used to be a waterway. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, I'm guessing that there's some sites like the Mammoth site that are very rich in, in right. this. But how do you find new sites? It's a little bit tricky. I mean, some of what we do, which I'm doing this summer, I'm taking a student out to uh, part of it will be prospecting, where we've, you know, we'll go back to the Tropic Shale, which is the formation that mine was found in, and we'll prospect, you literally just you know go back and forth and back and forth on a grid over rocks that you know have had fossils in them before and just hope to find something. And honestly, most of the time you just find little chips and fragments, but every once in a while you end up finding something that turns into a big skeleton, so. So patience is a virtue patience in this is in this, huge. In yeah, this you have job. to be willing to spend hours just staring at the ground, doing these transects back and forth and back and forth and finding nothing. And it's the same thing with the prep work. You know, it's patience. You're sitting there for hours gluing tiny little pieces, and they're very fragile and trying not to break anything and using dental picks. You know, it's it's a lot of patience. Did you ever break anything? That was of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can remember breaking my first thing that I broke. I went into my advisor's office and I said, Dave, I broke this. And he said, that's why, you know, paleontologists use glue. Glue is our best friend. And he was, this is no problem, you know, fit, was able to fix it. So it can be intimidating, but once you figure out, yeah, I can glue it. I mean, you want to be careful, but, you know. Here's this thing that's, you know, 90 million years old, mm -hmm. and I broke it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, mm -hmm. I think most of us have had our experiences, you know, especially as kids. Uh, you know, we go to the big museum, like the one in New York or the one in Chicago, yeah. and there's these ginormous yeah. dinosaurs. Uh, but the, the days of finding those are largely over. Is that right? Or no, are there still lots so of them out there to find? Yeah. yeah, I don't think so at all. I think there's a lot of great new paleontology that's going on. A lot of people are finding new stuff, and big stuff. I mean, there's new specimens coming out all the time, the new biggest this and the smallest this and the oldest this. So we're finding more and more stuff. And I think what helps is technology is increasing. So we're getting better at finding these things. And I think there's a lot of exciting areas for opportunity in paleontology. But not in Wisconsin so much, huh? <laughs> well, there's paleontology, just yeah. not, you know, I mean, we've got mammoths and mastodons. We've got some younger stuff. And then we've got older stuff that has shells and brachiopods and trilobites. Our state fossil of Wisconsin is a trilobite. So we do have fossils, we just don't have the types of fossils that I study. So there are mastodons, there are mastodon fossils in Wisconsin? Yes, there are, and mammoth, mammoth fossils as well. Most of them have been found in the southeastern part of the state. There's been a bunch around Kenosha, for example. Really, that would, yeah. be, that would be pretty cool. That would be very exciting. Do, they, do these places run um, uh, like interpretation, uh, uh, tours and that sort of thing where somebody who would like you when you were a little kid mm -hmm. could go and see something like that? I don't know while they're while they're digging them up. I know of some that are on display at the Kenosha Museum, but I'm not sure if there are any active sites right now. That would be cool. That would be cool. I mean those things are massive. Yeah, they're, but, huge. <laughs> they're huge. Well, um, you're watching Conversations from St. Norbert College. Joining us is Rebecca McKean, a St. Norbert College graduate and a professor whose area of expertise is paleontology, which is the study of prehistoric life. Well, let's talk a little bit about your time at St. Norbert College, okay? okay. So you're growing up in, uh, in Lake Mills, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you decided to come to St. Norbert College. What, what was it that 
attracted you to the St. Norbert? Uh, I actually came on a tour here when I was a sophomore. I'm a bit of a planner. <laughs> and <laughs> came as a sophomore in high school and was pretty well set on it. I actually only applied to two different places and knew I wanted to come here. I think it's just the feel. And I hear that a lot from our students now that you come and it just immediately feels like home. I mean, you talk about community, you can talk about it as much as you want, but you come on campus here and you really notice that everyone actually practices that. So, and and I met, you know, who would be my geology professors. I met Tim, Tim Flood and Nelson Hamm when I was here and they were just both really, really great positive people and felt like they would be good influences so yeah, every summer I know those those guys are taking oh, yeah. students all over the place yeah. uh, you know Tim was in uh, Antarctica yeah he over was. over uh, mm -hmm. the holidays if I'm not mistaken which mm -hmm. which is their summer so yeah. I guess if you got to go you, it's, it's, if you want sure. to yeah you know sure. all the, Hit yeah, the Nelson when spent you're a bunch of time in Alaska as well. So it's nice with geology. There's a lot of opportunity for travel. We're actually taking our students right after, uh, I don't know if I should say right after graduation because that will be dated, but um, we're taking them to northern Arizona for 10 days to the Grand Canyon and um, Flagstaff and Petrified National Forest and Meteor Crater. So we're excited to kind of get the opportunity to take our students around too. And it's kind of nice because, I mean, we graduate, you know, not a giant number of, uh, sure. of geology majors yeah. every year, and so the students really get a chance they to do. work with the professors and, and all that. That's, that's a really nice it thing. Is. And I know that you fit in pretty well with them because you care about, you know, the experience that the, the undergraduates have. But let's talk about when you were an undergraduate. Um, oh, I mean, no. it, must, it must seem <laughs> very different now that you're, uh, you know, in front of the classroom and sure. you're, you're asking them questions. What, mm -hmm. uh, what does that feel like? Um, well, I mean, first of all, campus is very different from when I was here. We've had a lot of new buildings put in, which is very exciting. And we're getting our science building renovation soon, so that's going to be a huge change. Um, I did worry a little bit. You know, I... I was very excited to come back to St. Norbert. As soon as I accepted the job, I thought, oh no, what if it's completely different as a faculty member than it was as a student, and, and panicked for a moment. <laughs> but as soon as I got back on campus, it was that same feeling of home and community. And um, our students here are great. It's been a lot of fun. I teach a lot of introductory level courses. So I have my shot at basically getting these students interested in science, which I actually kind of love that challenge because 95% of them are coming in just to take their science requirement and get it done and over with. And I love just sharing with them how amazing the earth is, how many cool things you can do with it and just having them look around them and see things a little bit differently. So it's like, I actually, I really, really love teaching here. It's going to be difficult for them to try to pull a fast one on you because you pretty much know all the, all the, <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> all the cool Have places to go track. and all, and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. So yeah. um, let's talk a little bit about the climate you know, here. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. climate change is a big deal, and geologists mm -hmm. have a lot to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of rejection, I guess, of some of the science that, uh, that has gone into climate change. Talk a little bit about that. From, as a scientist, what does that look sure. like to you? Um, it's very frustrating, I will say, because I'm not technically a climate scientist, although my, a lot of my PhD work was in studying climate, so I have kind of a vested interest in it. And I also feel like I have a vested interest in it because I teach my students about it every semester, and a lot of them come in thinking that either climate isn't changing or that, you know, the climate change is because, is because of natural causes. And so um, it's very frustrating to see the public think that because I think it's been made to look as though it's a debate. And when you actually look at the data, you know, it's something like 98% of climate scientists know and agree that the climate is changing and that it is caused by humans. So I don't think it's a debate at all. I don't think it's anything that needs to be argued about. Um, it's happening and now the question is what can we do about it? Well, it wasn't all that long ago that where we're sitting right now was covered by Ice, ice, right? And right. 10,000 years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And that lobe went all the way down, mm -hmm. right? And, and a lot of what we see in the moraines and all that mm -hmm. are, are what's left over from a fairly recent experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think anybody's predicting an ice age anytime soon. In the 70s, they were, by the way. I, I remember mm -hmm. that. That was their big, big concern. Mm -hmm. But um, what do you think would be the effects of climate change? here in Wisconsin, what, what, what would we likely see in maybe the next 50 years or so mm -hmm. if we don't make some changes? 
Um, in Wisconsin specifically, it's things that we've already started to see. Spring is going to come earlier, which spring is already starting to come earlier. Um, we're going to see just overall warmer temperatures, more extreme temperatures, more extreme um, weather events. So there's going to be a lot of changes that we will notice here that actually we're already starting to notice here. The ecology is going to change different types of vegetation in the area, different types of animals in the area. So, you know, it's, it's things that aren't just happening here. They're happening all over, but they're changes that we can notice here in the state. Well, one of the things I, I think is kind of cool about uh, doing the science of climate change is you have folks that are in, Antar in Antarctica right. that will drill down and yeah. get these long uh, oh, cores amazing. of ice mm -hmm. and they can actually measure mm -hmm. the amount of carbon dioxide that's trapped these in little, little gas bubbles. Yeah. yeah, it is pretty amazing. Uh, see, if I were a climate scientist, I'd probably go to Hawaii to study their climate. <laughs> <laughs> <That's, Yeah. laughs> or someplace where they had really nice mm -hmm. golf courses would be would be probably the, the, the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let me talk a little bit about um, about what kind of advice you would have for, you know, young people, especially young women, uh, that mm -hmm. are interested in science. You know, I don't think uh, when we think about people who study dinosaurs, and mm -hmm. we're thinking about the Indiana Jones hat, you know, <laughs> um, what sure. advice would you give these folks? Some of them are watching. Yeah, I mean, the advice I would give would be to work really hard. It's something that does require a lot of time and a lot of effort, and you have to be willing to work hard. So that's kind of my first piece of advice. Um, second piece of advice is to, you know, just have faith in yourself and, and believe. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but as, as a, um, sort of as an incoming woman scientist, I know that's something that I'm really passionate about is getting young women interested in science and to know that they can do science. So just kind of go forth with the idea that it, it can happen. It's not an impossible dream, sort of. So I don't know. I guess my my biggest advice is really just work hard. It's, you know. You have to have good grades to get into graduate school in science, you right? Know. And you know. in order to get uh, positions where you get to study this for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. you know, you you have to you know get through your PhD program and all that sort of thing. But it yeah. is possible to do. It is possible. You have to you know be passionate about it as well. You can't just kind of decide, yeah, this is okay. I don't think I don't know any paleontologists who just think it's okay. I think all of us kind of breathe it and live it and just feed on it because that's what we've always wanted to do. So if you've got the passion and the drive and you work hard, it is possible. So when you're done with uh, Southern Utah, mm -hmm. do you, are you thinking about another place to go? Are you thinking about other things to do? What's next for you? Yeah, I have a What's big... What's your next animal? <laughs> <laughs> My next animal. Um, I'm kind of stuck on plesiosaurs at the moment, to be honest, but I'm kind of branching out a little bit. Um, my new research, I have like a 10 to 15 year research goal that I... That, yeah. <laughs> you are a planner. <laughs> I am a planner. That, uh, you know, things that I want to do. But I'm studying taphonomy right now, which is basically how fossils are preserved. So kind of looking at what happens to them after they die, basically uh, before they get discovered. So how are they buried? How are they preserved? How do they become a fossil? And I want to do that with plesiosaurs and some of the other vertebrates from the seaway, like the mosasaurs and turtles and sharks and fish and things like that. So I do have a really long goal in figuring out how these things get preserved and why they're there. Well, that sounds like something that would be actually quite useful for the mm -hmm. folks who are doing that, which mm -hmm. means it probably can attract some grant money to, to do well, that. Let's which hope. Is... We're hoping so. <laughs> I've got an NSF grant proposal out right now that I'm waiting to hear on by the summer, so... Hopefully. Well, I hope that goes well for you. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to yeah, of tell us about about yeah. your cool discovery. Yeah. And uh, you know, we uh, we hope to have you back the next time. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. I hope you've enjoyed our show. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College. <laughs>